Welcome back, everybody. We got a great show for you. We are going to talk about the Bitcoin tether case has been settled. Oh, my. Oh, my. We're going to get into that. And then we're going to talk about the World Economic Forum, the Great Reset. And we're going to discuss what I believe is the evidence that reveals that it is unfolding right before our eyes. Let's roll that beautiful intro. Here we go. This is Digital Perspectives with Brad Kimes. Subscribe for new content notifications. Now, here's Brad Kimes. Come on in. Welcome back to the show, everybody. You can follow me on Twitter at Backup Bradley above at the top of the screen and everything that we're talking about here today. Let's go ahead and get into this thing because I do believe we are about to look at information that is really laid out in a way that lets you see that the World Economic Forum, the Great Resets, all the governments around the world are really playing along in this effort and i believe it affects each and every one of us let's start right here the market is actually recovering uh from the first video i put out this morning and bitcoin is back up to forty-eight thousand. i don't know if we're going to continue to see the market climb in a positive way but what i will tell you is is that we have settlement in the uh bitfinex tether lawsuit they settled with New York Attorney General for $18.5 million. Now, I don't think we need to see much more about this other than it's been settled. What's interesting about this to me, and I think XR, Attorney XRP or XRP Attorney made the point, and shout out to him because I think it's a great point. This case built up for two years with two and a half million documents submitted and the alleged you know, uh, backing of the reserves from Tether to be Bitcoin and was suggesting a Ponzi scheme has really quietly been settled for $18.5 million. Hmm. They have agreed to further transparency and reporting and those things going forward. I th Look, I think this is great for the space, but I do find it interesting that this is... The outcome, as much noise was made about this on the front end, who knows where these things go and what actually takes place back end and behind closed doors. But I tell you, I think this ultimately bodes well for the space. I congratulate Tether. I've always said, you know, uh, it was alleged. So I'm glad to find out for them that whatever it is, they've settled it for $18.5 million. And it looks like we're back to business as usual. And the market, I believe, may be responding to that just now a bit. So we are up from, I think, 15 or 16% down on the crypto space. We will see if that trend continues on that news alone. However, let's take a look at this because it just keeps getting bigger, everybody. You know, uh, this is bit true. They say they're supporting DFLR, which is an airdrop from Flare Finance, not to be confused with Flare Networks. OK, so and I think one of the things I just wanted to highlight about this is that think of Flare Networks as a condominium building. And then think of Flare Finance as all the different offices and businesses that exist on each floor in each office of that building, right? That's the way I see that, which is the different product offerings from Flare Finance, Flare Networks being the foundation for all of this that exists on it. So I just wanted to uh, make that little note and shout out to Bitru. I know that they are always on the front leading edge of, the, of these things. So really great stuff. All right. So here we go. Now, check this out. Binance has temporarily suspended withdrawals of Ethereum based on tokens due to high network congestion. What? Oh my goodness. I mean, smart contracts? The future? Congestion? What are we talking about here? We're talking about something that's not quite a solution make here, is what we're talking about at my house. Now, I'm not trying to dig on Ethereum. I've held it and still hold a bit of it, but not enough to change my life. But what I do understand is, is that, you know, look, this space is only getting bigger. The tech, the innovation, all of this driving new ways to settle and make contracts. And it's supposed to be because you want to create efficiency, scalability, uh, deeper security measures, right? Um uh, you know, all of this needs to come with the innovation. If we're seeing this now at this level, 
what are we talking about? It, you know, smart contracts. How smart are you going to feel if you run into this problem now? Imagine when we 10x, when we get the clarity and the unified framework in the space, what, what comes of it then? I mean, we're going to see mass adoption at some point. How do we rectify the congestion and the high gas fees on networks like Ethereum? You know, regardless of the Tether lawsuit and things like that and, and, and unified framework that can provide clarity for the space, those things notwithstanding, this is a personal hurdle in front of Ethereum. Just like Ripple and the SEC lawsuit is a personal hurdle in front of XRP. It, you know, every coin has its hurdles. We shouldn't be afraid to look at those as we do XRP here on the channel. All right, moving forward here, just a little note, 288.5 million XRP. Woo! <laughs> Binance and BitBite moved 288.5 million XRP. Okay, you caught me. I was moving a shallow bag. <laughs> Just all you should know. All right, now let's get into this because look at the trend of this news I'm getting ready to lay out for you right now. Again, I, I covered this piece, but I just I want to tie this into what's going on here. I believe all of this ties into evidence that we're seeing of a new Bretton Woods from the IMF and specifically the Great Reset from the World Economic Forum. And I think we're going to look at the action moving towards that goal right now. One of which is the U.S. Treasury Secretary floats the idea of a digital dollar maintained by the Fed. That's right. The more we see CBDCs moving closer to launch and testing and piloting all of these things, the more we see the execution to move towards a new system, which the World Economic Forum has highlighted extremely well. We're going to look at that in a second. Then we see to back up that notion about moving to a digital dollar, the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston, we covered yesterday or the day before, President Eric Rosengreen expects Bitcoin prices to come under pressure. He said China and Sweden are on their way to implementing their central bank digital currency, commenting that the U.S. was not far behind in the process. Well, you know, you hear Jerome Powell say it. He says we're a few years off. That's what he says. But the reality here is I believe we're a lot closer than any of us realize, myself included. And here is some more information. The IMF believes that the best way for central banks to compete with the fast-paced digital currency revolution is to build a system where the private sector can convert its assets into central bank currency. Well, and we got the on and off ramps. We want to provide you with the digital version of the paper fiat government dollars of the world in order to make you more comfortable to be able to uh, access this new financial system and digital assets right? Settlement, transactions, whatever suits you in your life, whether you're an investor or just somebody who wants to make payments across the world to family members or through your business. You know, when I look at this stuff, you know, one of the things that really, really stays with me here is relevance. I liken this to understanding what happened with Napster and digital file sharing in the early days of the internet. The record industries thumbed their nose to the innovation in the tech and said, ah, it's no big deal. Today, the entire music industry has been turned on its head because of that digital innovation in tech. Nothing is the same about that industry at all. And make no mistake about it, I believe that the banks of the world, including the IMF, understand that little story that went down that I just shared with you. They don't want it to become them. And they understand that they are not innovators and that public-private relationship is in fact the key to keep central banks in power, in control, and relevant. Make no mistake about it. Here's some more evidence of that happening. Bank of Japan's year-long digital yen pilot begins this spring. <laughs> no grass growing underneath their feet. Major Asian banks unite to form multiple CBDC pact on blockchain? Say it isn't so. I think the whole understanding about remaining relevant, in control, and powerful, and understanding that if we, the banks, become that exchange to that digital dollar to onboard and offboard you off of this digital asset space or payment space, 
we remain relevant. Even if in the future, the brick and mortar goes away to a great degree and we just become more a node in a transaction fee collector, right? So, and one more, SBI, which is an early investor into Ripple and a huge advocate for the use of XRP and also part owner in R3. SBI joins JP Morgan's blockchain-based payment network. Tie-up is expected to reduce SBI customer transaction costs. Listen to this. Help cross-border payments reach beneficiaries faster and using limited steps. JPM expands into India. Well, that takes me to the World Economic Forum that I've been running up your flagpole since January of 2020. What does this say on page 17? The most relevant for wholesale CBDC settlement between crypto assets designed for inter- or intra-bank payments and settlements is JPM coin and XRP. JPM joins with SBI for cross-border based payments, and now it's expanding into India. The World Economic Forum, the Great Reset, is well underway. It's almost vision complete. Then we look here at Fed payments. Now, before you hit me with Fed now and the Fed payments, I know it's a domestic platform, okay? So let's just know that right now. But listen to what they say. Most payment stakeholders agree faster payments are a necessity, but say interoperability, high upfront costs, implementation complexity are hindering adoption. Let's quickly take a look at this. In addition to highlighting the importance of faster payments, respondents named several challenges hindering adoption, one being interoperability was a front runner, with nearly 48% citing that the top that was at the top of the challenges. Respondents agreed, however, that overall significance of interoperability, 92%, said it was either somewhat or very important. High upfront cost and complexity to implement were cited as key challenges by 44% of respondents, and internal business justification was cited as a challenge by about one third or 34% of the recipients. Respondents, excuse me. Uh, when compared last year, Fed, uh, faster payments barometer, the top two challenges remained the same for respondents. However, 35% of the respondents also mentioned lack of common rules and standards in the previous survey. So listen, I understand that the Fed payments and all of this is more about domestic settlement in the U.S. and these kinds of things and peer-to-peer uh, -peer payments, business-to-peer, all of it, right? However, these things being cited about interoperability, these things being cited about common rules and standards, oh, I can't help but think, is there something that could help back in to really solve these issues for interoperability? Is there something back end that could be used that could really already have the governance and compliance built into the network? <laughs> yeah, there is. It's RippleNet and ODL and the use of XRP in the ledger. Come on in. Now, when I think of that, let's finish right here, because we know that the uh, Ripple has filed in November of 2020, on November 2nd, they filed for a business license, uh, Ripple Markets. Well, what's interesting is about this, and if I could just go through the timeline here, I put together something nice for us. You know, and let me see if I can find it because I had it pulled and let me see if I can find it right here. Uh, is this the one? Yes. October 6th. This is on October 6th. Ripple threatens to leave the U.S. over crypto regulation, right? And on November 2nd of 2020, they actually filed, we find out just recently, for a business license in Wyoming, understanding that that business license is really uh, looks like the key path to being on your way to next step being a bank and applying for a bank charter license out of Wyoming as Kraken did. You have to wonder when you look at this, 
October 6th, Chris Larson threatened to move. November 2nd, Ripple files for a Wyoming business license, we find out. December 12th, Flare Snapshot takes place. And December 2020, uh, we find out on the 22nd, and actually on the 21st, Brad Garlinghouse told us, we're going to be sued by the SEC. And then the next day, the actual lawsuit comes out from Ripple because they couldn't reach an agreement. And the SEC, in fact, does release the lawsuit against Ripple December 22nd. How about that for a timeline? Again, I have to say the flare snapshot and all of these things, I think, tie into this whole timeline that we saw the threat to move. And then we learn of the one month later, a filing for a Wyoming business license. There has to be some kind of look, this is either gamesmanship or it's working out and negotiating the deal that will eventually become the settlement of this case. You know, I don't know whether they did it as a strategic positioning to say, you know what, let's go the role of Wyoming and do that. I, mean, I know that they were very vocal about moving out of the country, Singapore, UK, some other place. But to apply for that business license in Wyoming tells me that maybe these negotiations are pushing towards either a security designation or the fact that if Ripple, in fact, is to remain the steward of the escrow, as we've talked about on this channel, I don't see how they can do it without actually becoming a central bank of sorts because they have their own form of money. They have XRP and they have 50 billion plus in escrow that I believe is actually probably held by PolySign, which was created by Arthur Brito and, and uh, David Schwartz, which is my speculation, obviously. But regardless of that, I do believe that they have that escrow. I, we all know that they get the they are the steward of what is released every month. They determine how much goes back into the kitty and how much stays out for OTC. And they also sell that OTC and in Q2 of 2020 remind us that they participate in the buyback off the secondary market, which is really to create stability in the asset itself. Just like you see the Fed print more dollars, right? Or pull some off and don't you don't print. You know, the <laughs> the only thing that can kill the golden goose is everyone sitting on the XRP and no one actually using it. And in fact, that's why, you know, retail is not really the ones moving the price in my eyes right now, because we buy it and sit on it. And there's not enough of us to move it past 25 or 28 cents, because we saw plenty of evidence of that for well over a year. We couldn't move the needle. So now with the handicap restrictions between exchanges not allowing you to trade it or uphold or bit true, you have to trade into it or you have to have a restriction on how much you can do daily. That's a very low limit. And the price has been going up while the case is going on. Or has it been the fact that market makers that are participants in the use of this asset have begun to buy it up off the exchanges? One has to wonder what's actually going on here. We do know that they recently opened up a lending program with a payback scenario for their customers for XRP as well. These things make Ripple look like a central bank because a central bank is a lender of last resort. All I know is, is that this gets more interesting by the day and it really makes you think of the post from Mr. B XRP, Ripple Bank XRPB abandoned in 2018. Could it be back on the table now that Wyoming has got a new business license? with Ripple markets? I don't know, but I tell you this, it isn't the first time that Ripple's considered being a bank, and I really believe they may be on their way to not just being a bank, but becoming a new central bank with a new form of money. That's going to do it for me. Hit the like and subscribe, leave a comment below. The World Economic Forum, the plan is rolling out right before our eyes. Don't believe it. It's still true. Make sure you hit the like and subscribe. Leave a comment below. Hit the notification bell. Make sure you check out all the links in the description box and the comment section. Clinton Donnelly. It's tax time, ladies and gentlemen. Clinton Donnelly is the crypto tax fixer. Don't mess around. This guy knows what's going on. He can help you. Link in the description. I'll catch all of you on the next one.